Hey, hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Ori Wortman, a research fellow at Israel's Institute for National Security Studies and at the University of South Wales, join us to discuss the inside story of Israel's destroying Syria's nuclear reactor. Dr. Wortman will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Dr. Ori Wortman. Thank you so much, Stacey, and Shabbat Shalom to everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. And you asked me to speak about uh, the story, the inside story of how Israel destroyed the nuclear reactor in Syria, and uh, mainly the, the little boxing fight between the two Ehuds, Ehud Barak and uh, Defense Minister Ehud Barak and Prime Minister Ehud Olmert back then. But before we start to uh, delve into the argument between the two Ehuds, I want to explain a bit how I did that research. Um, that uh, article, this article basically is based on my PhD, one of the chapter, chapters of my PhD. And the unique uh, contribution was that I made a lot of interviews with uh, the key players of the Israeli decision-making uh, figures, uh, Ehud Omert, Ehud Barak, Amos Yadlin, uh, Isaac Herzog, like I, I Basically, I interviewed all the main uh, players, the main key players uh, during that time. And uh, even though the, that interviews are amazing too, unfortunately, as once Amos Yadlin told me, every interviewer has its own selective memory. So before, in, in order to, let's say, delve a bit into the, argument between the two Ehuds. Let's start a bit with Olmert's assumption and plan of work before Barack, uh, Barack became prime minister. Um, in essence, it was clear to the Israeli decision makers that the nuclear reactor being built in Syria uh, posed an existential security threat to the state of Israel. And therefore, the facility must be destroyed. However, it was necessary for them to look at the situation broadly and think about the consequences resulting from the attack before deciding when and how to act. And there were two considerations, in fact. The first one, it was important to know when the reactor would be operational, since attacking a hot reactor can certainly lead to an ecology, a, 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 um, ecological and environmental disaster. And therefore, it is better to destroy the facility before it becomes active. Uh, the second consideration was that there was a great concern among the Israeli decision makers that had Israel eliminated the reactor in Syria, the Assad regime, of course, in cooperation with the Lebanese Hezbollah organization, might react and launch a right raging confrontation against Israel. And it was clear to Israeli decision makers that the Syrian missiles are not the Hezbollah missiles back in 2006. Uh, and those missiles would, would hit strategic facilities in Israel, and that the Israeli home front would suffer more severe damage in comparison to what Israel experienced in the summer of 2006 against Hezbollah. And eventually, Olmert's instructions to the military echelon were very clear, as he asked to make every effort so that the, that the bombing of the reactor would not lead to a war with Syria. However, in case uh, war with Syria is inevitable, this upcoming confrontation must be conducted successfully, of course, and should not end like the Second Lebanon War. As all of you recall, uh, it was perceived as an unsuccessful war among the Israeli public back then in 2006. Um, so in a sense, um, Olmert instructed the military echelon to prepare a number of alternative operations. Uh, and the guiding criteria of each action was to destroy the reactor while maintaining a low Israeli signature in order not to be drawn into a broad confrontation with Syria following the attack. And operationally, the military echelon presented three barriers to, to an Israeli strike on the reactor. The first was that the Syrian nuclear reactor must be attacked before it becomes operational. Um, 
the second obstacle was uh, that an Israeli attack uh, must be carried out before the Syrians know that Israel knows about the existence of the reactor. And of course, the concern was that if Hassett found out that his nuclear project has been exposed, um, he might place missiles batteries to protect the reactor or even establish a kindergarten in the compound in order to make it difficult for Israel to destroy it. And the third hindrance was that an attack should be executed before winter time, as the IDF would be more comfortable conducting a war in favorable weather conditions, especially in the context or, uh, of the Air Force. And therefore, the recommendation of the military echelon was that the attack should be executed no later than September, October 2007. And so the IDF began to prepare itself for a military strike, focusing on two things. First, preparing an operational plan to destroy the reactor. And second, since the destruction of the reactor could lead uh, Syria and Hezbollah to start a war, preparing the Air Force for a comprehensive confrontation against uh, Syria and Hezbollah. So at the beginning of April, uh, Omer decided to share the, that matter uh, with the American administration. And in a sense, Olmert had two main reasons why it was necessary to involve the American administration in the reactor issue. The first one was that Olmert wanted, let's say, and I try to be cautious, even though uh, it was according to Olmert uh, interview that I made with him, and also uh, you can read it in his book. In a sense, Olmert wanted to abroad the American government, believing that had the Americans destroyed the reactor, it could be a clear warning signal to Iran, which itself sought to reach a nuclear reactor capability until today. And second, Olmert believed that the chance for retaliation from Syria was lower if America would execute a military strike to eliminate the reactor. So in mid-April, Israeli Prime Minister Olmert dispatched Mossad Director uh, Dagan to Washington in order to share the intelligence about the nuclear uh, facility with the Americans. And after he shared the information regarding uh, the reactor with the US administration, the Israeli prime minister began to expand the circle of secret uh, partners. And uh, during the period uh, from late April to, er uh, to early May, let's say, Omer began sharing information with members of the Israeli cabinet. And it's, it's very important to understand um, the Lebanon, the second Lebanon war, um, for that previous summer of 2006, hung heavily in the air. And to date, it is quite clear that the Second Lebanon War brought back Israeli deterrence against Hezbollah. But uh, in the summer of 2007, the prevailing opinion among the Israeli public was that the campaign in Lebanon was quite unsuccessful one. And wishing to avoid another war, the Israeli security cabinet members hoped that the Americans would be the ones to take the take on the task of destroying the nuclear reactor in Syria. Um, and in early June, um, signs began to indicate that the Syrians were moving toward the time when the reactor would become operational. And uh, it's, it's important to mention that one of the indi indicators for understanding when the reactor turns out was the construction of a water pipeline between the reactor and the Euphrates River. Uh, on the banks of which the Syrians built a water pumping station uh, in order to cool the reactor. So what happened is that all the political echelon and also the military echelon understood that this was the right moment to destroy the reactor. And the main hindrance back then was the entry of the new old defense minister, Ehud Barak, who won the elections for the chairman of the Labour Party into office. Uh, he, he entered into office on June 15. And this has changed all the discourse uh, among the political action. But, you know, before, let's say speaking, uh, I'm not saying speaking negatively about Barack, of course, it's not the case. It's very important to understand to, to Barack's credit he had a rich resume of operational experience gained during his military and political career, including as a fighter and commander 
of the general staff uh, reconciles regiment, better known as Sayyid Matkal. And Barak, who previously served as prime minister, defense minister, and IDF chief of staff, planned and participated in many daring operations and was considered the most decorated soldier in the IDF history. So before we judge Barak, we need to understand all of his resume. And Barak, who was already informed by Olmert about the discovery uh, of the reactor in May 2007, he believed that the reactor in Syria posed an existential security threat to the state of Israel, and of course should be therefore be destroyed. Yet while Olmert and the heads of the military echelon sought to destroy the reactor within a few weeks, Barak suggested that let's wait and uh, an additional alternatives to destroy the reactor be explored. And in essence, the new defense minister believed that since there was a period of three months left until the reactor would be operational, I remind you that we are in June and uh, the estimation was that uh, there is time until September. So it was appropriate to act according to Barack with discretion rather than recklessly. And uh, according to Barack uh, in the interview I conducted with him, when he entered his position as, as defense minister, he discovered that there were two operational plans um, to destroy the reactor. And operationally, Barack claimed that in order to destroy the reactor, the action plan must be, uh, let's say, it must meet two conditions. Uh, first, an absolute certainty that the demolition of the facility, and the second, low signature action to reduce the likelihood of a Syrian response, leading to a large scale confrontation. And uh, from a professional perspective, Barack believed that the two plans were operationally not good enough um, because uh, before that, um, he was, uh, the, the army introduced two operation plans to him and therefore he believed that those two plans were operationally not good enough, arguing that none of them met the two main criteria for a successful outcome. And to his understanding, while the first plan uh, would not certainly destroy the reactor, but very confidently would not lead to war, the second plan in contrast would confident, confidently destroy the reactor, but there was a reasonable probability that war would break out with Syria afterwards. Um, so, since according to Barak's judgment, there was still a period of three months until the reactor in Syria would become operational, he instructed the military echelon to prepare operational plans that would meet two criteria, as I said, certain destruction of the reactor and an Israeli strike with low signature that would prevent the possibility uh, of war with Syria. And uh, what happened is that an argument because, um, launched, let's say, between Olmert's uh, perspective that Israel should destroy the reactor ASAP and Barak that thought that we have time and let's make more, uh, let's, let's uh, see that uh, and, and find out that the military operation um, is in the right moment to act, that uh, the army um, tried all these alternatives and now he has, it has uh, the best operation uh, to destroy the nuclear facility, according to those two criteria that I introduced before. And uh, apart from, you know, it's, it's very important to understand that it seems that had Defense Minister and Labor Chairman Barack wanted to delay the operation, he would at least have tried to persuade Labor Security Cabinet Minister to support his line of action. But according to Isaac Hartzer, the current Israeli president, who was one of Labor Security Cabinet ministers and was politically close to Barack, um, Barack did not address the issue and refrained from seeking his support. And the fact that Barack did not even try to contact Herzog on that matter, stressed the former version in which Barack encouraged the military echelon to examine and verify all the operational alternatives to the demolition of the reactor. But however, according to Olmert, Barack did address other security cabinet ministers, including, uh, for instance, uh, Justice Minister Professor Daniel Friedman, 
contending that the attack on the Syrian reactor could lead to the destruction of the state of Israel. This is what uh, Olmert, uh, Olmert said. But um, it was not the only dispute between the two Euds, um, as the two also had an argument of how to act operationally. And uh, I try to be very cautious. Um, the military echelon proposed operational plans for the destruction of the reactor in Syria, but Barak recounts two plans, as I mentioned, of action that were presented to him. And the first was uh, introduced by the Israeli Air Force. Um, and of course, it was an aerial operation with a low signature. And uh, the second, uh, compared to the aerial operation, the second uh, uh, suggestion of act uh, by the army was a ground action, um, which, uh, of course, that the, 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 the figure that introduced it was uh, suggested it was uh, Aman director Amos Yadlin, who was, of course, in charge of Serat Matkal. And we can assume that uh, Serat Matkal, the, the special unit of the Israeli army, uh, would conduct that plan. And uh, the suggested plan was a ground operation in which a commander force uh, would, uh, would destroy the nuclear reactor in Syria. And uh, of course, while Olmert preferred the low signature air operation, which would almost certainly destroy the reactor and prevent the risk of uh, ground fighters, it is likely that Barak, who in the past, as I, as I told you, was the commander of South Matkal and himself participated in many operations beyond enemy lines. Uh, we can assume that he preferred the ground operation with the participation of special forces. And if so, it is likely that not only the political rivalry uh, or, and the question of when was the right moment to, to destroy the reactor were at the root of the controversy between the two Euds. However, it seems that also the operational matter of how to demolish the reactor uh, clouded, if I can say, the relationship and mistrust between Omert and Barak. So in any case, before I'm ending my 15 minutes, I can tell you that even though it seems that no one supported Barak from our interviews that I conducted, um, I'm not saying half of the cabinet, but there were at least four uh, cabinet ministers and also uh, uh, the Israeli Air Force commander, Eliezer Shkedi. Uh, they thought that what Barak did was, uh, was normal as he tried to see all the options uh, uh, and what is the, the, the correct options of destroying the reactor without uh, risk Israel uh, for another round uh, of war in the north, this time against Syria. And it seems that also, as I said, um, the operation matter of how to demolish the reactor uh, clouded the relationship be uh, between the two. But in any case, I think that we have a conundrum here, as it is very difficult to decide uh, between the two ver versions and who was right at the end. So I'm open for questions. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. The first one we have is from Nisan Bori asking, how was the existence of the reactor discovered? OK, the, the reactor basically discovered uh, by accident. Um, what happened is that uh, it's very important uh, to tell you that uh, there was the case of the Libyan nuclear reactor. And uh, back then, until Gaddafi uh, told all the world that he has a nuclear reactor, what happened is that uh, it's not nice to say, but the Israeli intelligence uh, were in the middle of their dream back then. And uh, I think uh, the Israeli uh, military echelon and especially Amman were quite in shock <laughs> when, they, uh, when they found out that uh, Libya built a nuclear reactor. 
and uh, Amos Yadlin, uh, the head of the man from January 2006, he was not responsible back then what happened in Libya. There was another uh, Amman uh, chief. Uh, uh, he told me that in his first day, he, he made a meeting with all his uh, operational officers and uh, he asked them do everything to find out whether another Arab country or Muslim country is built, uh, are planning to build or build um, a nuclear reactor in their, uh, in their territory. And after, let's say, in the summer of 2006, six, six months afterwards, um, Amman discovered uh, an isolated facility in the desert near, uh, near to the river. And the conundrum was, sorry, what the hell is this facility? What's going on over there? Why in the middle of the desert? What, what are they going to do with it? And uh, since Saman has its own capabilities and instruments, they ask from the Mossad, today we can tell this because uh, there is no censorship on it. They ask uh, Mossad, uh, Yadlin, they went to the gun and told them, listen, let's, uh, let's check what's going on over there. And the Mossad, uh, unfortunately, it's hard to say, but they were very arrogant. They didn't believe that their Syria has the capabilities to build a nuclear reactor. And of course they were wrong. And he said, in Hebrew, it's nicer to say, but uh, no reactors, no bears, okay? Uh, like uh, there is no, there is not a chance that, uh, that uh, Syria, uh, that that facility of course is not a, a nuclear reactor. And there is not a chance that Syria is going to build, but uh, Yadlin, uh, press harder and harder, and eventually the Mossad uh, made uh, an operation act uh, in Vienna, and uh, stole uh, the computer of the head of the atomic uh, uh, nuclear um, committee uh, of Syria, and they took his laptop, and they found out many pictures exposing that uh, the North Koreans built a nuclear reactor uh, in that facility. So this is the story, how it happened. Thank you. Uh, JL asks, um, so with Barack, I, I know you didn't say necessarily proved wrong. It was, it was inconclusive, but uh, she said, or he says, uh, Barack was obviously proven wrong in his concerns and his cautions. Does this say something about the biases that even experienced military commanders may have when weighing in on military operations? Again, it is, it, it's very hard to judge uh, Barack and also Olmert because um, the political arena is very complicated, but um, I will not say that uh, in a security matters, they forget the politics. No, we're human beings. Of course, we are, sometimes we're a nest. And uh, sometimes, um, you know, this is, this is part of the game, but I think, and uh, according to the interviews that I made, um, I think that Barack 100% uh, did the right thing. But I don't, I can't say 100% uh, whether he had uh, other consideration, maybe political consideration. No one can say it. Uh, even Omar cannot say it, only Barack knows it. But I believe that Barack, the only consideration he had was, uh, the main consideration, let's say he had, was uh, that this uh, terrible threat on the Jewish state will be demolished. And I can tell you, uh, uh, Isaac Herzog told me that Barack was thrilled when the operation succeeded, and I think that some people um, took the political uh, aspects and tried to bring it to the security field, and I think that Omer did a great job, and all the Jewish uh, people need to thank him, and also Barack did a tremendous job uh, as well, and uh, this is the important thing, and I think it's better not to, let's say, delve too much into that uh, confrontation. We need to understand that they are there, 
but uh, and they will be there. I guess every country has its uh, own uh, arguments between uh, between the decision makers. But the most important thing that Israel uh, destroyed the Syrian nuclear reactor. Thank you. So looking back on history to explain current events, uh, Jay asked, how is the Iranian situation similar as well as different than destroying the Syrian uh, reactor? And then an anonymous attendee follows up asking, is Israel going through the same operations process now? I can tell you 100% that there were plans to destroy the Iranian nuclear reactor during the when Barak was defense minister and also uh, under uh, the under Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, it was it was published. Every, everybody everybody knows it, but uh, everyone knows it. But um, the main different difference, sorry, between uh, demolishing. Uh, also, the, the Iraqi nuclear reactor in uh, 1981, and the Syrian uh, nuclear reactor in 2007, and com in comparison to the Iranian nuclear uh, program, okay, is that while in Iraq and Syria, there was only one reactor, okay, one facility, in Iran, there are five, six, who knows? <laughs> we still don't know. We know that there are mainly two, Okay, two or three, but uh, there are more, and this is what we know about. What about the things that we don't know? And uh, in order to destroy the Iranian nuclear facilities, not facility, uh, we need a ground breaking operation. We need, let's say, 100 airplanes, aircrafts. This is something huge. It's not like taking eight pilots uh, with the F-16 or F-15 and send them to Syria and uh, bomb the reactor and go back, even though it's very uh, a tough task. But this is something very, uh, very hard operationally. They can, Israel can do it, but uh, it's going to be a different task than uh, destroying uh, the Syrian nuclear reactor. But by the way, for the Americans, it's, it's, uh, it's lunchtime for them. <laughs> they, they can do it very easily, but the problem is that they don't want to. And I think that, um, especially with the Biden government, uh, I think that the appeasement with Iran is a terrible mistake with those barbarians. And I'm not sorry, they are barbarians, that this is a barbarian regime. Um, with this regime, you can't appease it. You can't appease it. You need to destroy all their uh, nuclear capabilities, and then start talking with them because this is the only language they understand. And if the United States of America will not do its job to be the superpower of the world, then it's not the United States of America. Unfortunately, I'm saying this with all of my heart because the United States. This is the true partner and friend and family of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish state. Thank you. Ken Miller elaborates more on, on all the points you just made about Iran and the differences between Syria and all the different sites and the hidden sites throughout the country and uh, the ground to air defense. Um, is it really possible tactically for Israel to perform an attack on Iran? I'm not in an official uh, um, position. I'm a researcher, but uh, according to what I read and what I know, everything is possible. Israel has its capabilities, I believe, to do it, even though, again, I'm not in an official position. I don't know the secret of the state. And if I had known, I would never say. Um, Israel has its capabilities, I assume, to conduct this operation. Uh, but we need the back of the United States, of course. But again, it's better that the Americans will do it. Uh, the United States Army uh, is the best in the world. It's Air Force. Maybe they don't have the best pilots, but they 100% they have the best equipment uh, to, to destroy that nuclear facility in, uh, in Iraq. Facility, sorry. And what do you think it would take for the United States to, to join in on that? Guts. That's it. 
you need to bring back your guts. That's it. Uh, the appeasement, what I see with the American administration right now, I think it's a terrible thing. And I'm not politically correct. I'm trying to be correct. Uh, to appease the Iranians and, and to discuss whether uh, it's a terror organization or not a terror organization and what I hear in, uh, in the news of the American media, I think it's a terrible thing. You need to be back a superpower and do what you need to do and not to appease all those radical regimes all over the world. All right. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the close of our webinar. Before we go, can you tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? I urge you to, first of all, you can Google me and you find uh, another article, another articles that I wrote, uh, op ads, uh, Jerusalem Post, um, Ynet, and of course in English, Times of Israel. Um, but mainly in Jerusalem Post, but I urge you to read Strategic Assessment. This is the journal. Uh, it's also a great journal like Middle East Quarterly, but the journal of the INSS, it's called, as I say, Strategic Assessment. You can enter the INSS uh, website and all the articles are in English and you can find a very interesting article that I wrote about the Oslo peace process that also is based on interviews and in a sense, I argued that the Oslo peace process was a security move, not a peace process. Uh, it was a mechanism, like a tool, um, to curb the one-state solution. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Wortman, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Stacey, and Shabbat Shalom. It was a great pleasure and honor. And stay safe. Thank you. Same to you. For our viewers, bye bye. please be on the look. <laughs> bye. Please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a great day.